All right, should we go ahead and uh, get started? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Carrie Kinney. I'm uh, co-chair with Gar Darla Castelli for uh, one of the Bridging Barriers initiatives, the Whole Communities Whole Health initiative here at UT. Uh, next slide. So what I'd like to do is just give you guys a little bit of background about Whole Communities Whole Health and then uh, introduce our speakers so we have as much time as possible to um, hear from them and to answer questions on some of their really interesting uh, work. So the, the overall goal of WholeCom, or as we say, Whole Communities Whole Health, is to better understand and address what matters most to communities facing health disparities so families can lead healthier and happier lives. Um, to address this in this Bridging Barriers program, we've brought together researchers from all over campus. Some of uh, these departments are shown here, social work, communications, health, engineering, psychology. And in fact, there are something on the order of 27 UT departments who are involved. Next slide. So the idea behind Whole Communities Whole Health is to reinvent how we work with communities to understand what factors are um, affecting the health of members in, within those communities. So we're not just looking at, for instance, just the environmental determinants of health, which of course we're talking about environmental sensing today, but we're also looking at the physical health of the uh, participants and also the social and emotional health of uh, participants in these communities. We're looking at all these different factors that ultimately can affect the health of families um, in the communities that we're working with. We also want to uh, re-envision how we work with communities. So in instead of taking our kind of preconceived ideas as researchers as to what's important or what questions the community wants answered, we're flipping that around and asking the community first and families within the communities, you know, what are you guys most interested in? What, are you, what, are, what questions do you want answered? What are your concerns? And we're kind of meeting in the middle then between what the kind of research driven questions, if you will, and what the community needs. What, is, what do the community members want answered? Um, if you just click one, I think it animates here. So this is truly an interdisciplinary effort. Um, just to give you an idea of the scope of what we've uh, done so far, we've completed several large uh, pilot scale studies that have involved thousands of participants where we've tested out you know, all these different measures across physical, uh, mental, and emotional health, as well as environmental health. Uh, next uh, bullet, if you would. And just to give you a, a very brief snapshot of kind of the range of measures we've been looking at, we've been looking at stress, uh, physical activity, environmental exposures, sleep quality, plus so much more. Um, so many of these, we've been talking with the community members to figure out, you know, what are you interested in hearing about? So with regard, for instance, to environmental exposures, they've told us um, the community we're working with is in Eastern Travis County. They've told us, for instance, that air quality is a really big concern for them and also water quality as an example. Uh, next slide. So um, if you're if just giving examples, if you will, in one area of environmental sensing uh, that we've been looking at over the last actually couple years, um, we've done uh, developed indoor air quality sensors. We call it the Bevo Beacon. Uh, you can see the box there that uh, measures many different indoor air quality parameters. But also, and I'm giving a hint, uh, Pavel will be uh, presenting on this today. We've also, in response to concerns about odor and air pollution um, in their community, we've also been working with Pavel and others to look at outdoor air quality. Next slide. And we've been uh, active with the community. Um, the program was launch launched in 2018, and of course, uh, <laughs> With the COVID pandemic, things have slowed down and, you know, there's been a lot of uh, concerns within the community, but um, we've been working with our community strategy team to identify what are the issues that the community members want us to address. Um, we've had multiple talk about focus groups where we talk with community members about, you know, what are their environmental concerns, what are their concerns about their community, what are their points of pride in their community. 
Um, we've also launched several uh, uh, responses, if you will, uh, to these concerns. So of course, with COVID-19 being such an issue for everyone, um, we've uh, partnered with Avamos to, um, on the pop-up vaccination clinics. Um, also the mobile air quality survey that Pavel will be talking about today. And, you know, for instance, activity bags for um, members of our, you know, like uh, children in our community so they can be more physically active. And just to let you know where we are in this process, um, we're just about uh, finished getting our IRB in place and we are rolling out many of these measures that we've been piloting over the last two years with ambassador families in the community. And then once these ambassador families tell us, you know, what's working, what's not working, um, we will continue to roll out um, to uh, families were ultimately uh, hoping to, in this first year, have 100 families involved in our study. And just to give you an, an example of some of the um, technology, if you will, that we've been uh, working on and some of the innovation, um, one important component of our study is not just to, you know, identify, you know, have the community and the researchers, you know, meet in the middle and identify what are the issues that we would, uh, would like to address, but also once we gather the data, instead of marching off and writing papers, which is kind of the classic thing, and we are writing our papers, but we want to give them information back to the community. So we're working with um, Christine, Julian, Cameron Craddock, and a whole team to develop a phone app that actually has a participant dashboard so they can get information on outdoor air quality, for instance. They can look at their indoor air quality from the beacon sensor. Um, they can uh, track their sleep or their activity using a wearable Fitbits and other um, wearable devices. And so this is something we're super excited about uh, rolling out and we're working with uh, folks in the iSchool and others to of course make it look less like engineers have developed it and more than something that's, uh, that'll be a little bit more community friendly. And with that, I think if you go to the next slide, I'd like to uh, get right into it. Um, so, Today's topic is environmental sensing and really how that relates to uh, health and, uh, and the health of communities. Um, our first speaker will be Pavel Mitzal. He's an assistant professor in civil engineering. Um, he runs the Sniffer Laboratory. And um, I think after you see his presentation, you'll understand what he means by the Sniffer Lab. He looks at indoor, outdoor air pollution, atmospheric chemistry, and the links to health. Our next speaker, speaker is Sergio Castanaños. He's an assistant professor. Um, he has a really cool lab name, Reset, Rapid, Equitable, and Sustainable Energy Transitions Lab. Um, and one of his many areas that he looks at is equitable, clean tech adoptions and deployment strategies. And then uh, finally, Deb Niogi is um, a professor, actually joint in geological sciences and uh, in engineering as well. And so we're really happy to have him with us. Um, he's um, done quite a bit. So you're, you're, you've done so many things, Deb. I'll just pick one, the American Meteorological Society Board of Urban Environment as an example. And more locally, if you will, and also globally, he's been looking at urban heat mapping and climate change efforts. So with that, um, we can transition to Pavel. Thanks so much, Kerry, for this nice uh, introduction and thanks for having me. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, will be um, really new preliminary mobile air quality sniffer measurements we have recently conducted in Austin and the region in collaboration and synergy with uh, Holcom. Um, and I will start from the question, why do we need this novel environmental sensing? Um, measurements. So the fundamental understanding, or maybe I should say lack of understanding, is in the composition of our air. Our understanding is completely skewed towards the most abundant compounds, which usually happen not to be very toxic. And also these uh, compounds span orders of magnitude in concentration but also toxicity spans orders of magnitude. So sometimes something which is really unabundant can be much more re relevant for health effects and toxicity. 
if you look at the map of respiratory health effects in Austin, you can see that in the southeast region, uh, Del Valle, and th where there are some um, uh, underprivileged communities, uh, unfortunately, there is pretty high incidence of these respiratory adverse health outcomes. If we, for example, compare to a different city, for example, Riverside in California, this distribution is a little bit more uniform. It's not so much centered in one location. Well, coincidentally, it happens that in this southeast area of Austin, this, uh, there are many pollution sources, industrial, there are power plants, there are um, landfills and so on. So we really need to, to make more of these measurements. And we are super lucky because we have one of the a few in the nation, um, state-of-the-art uh, uh, proton transfer reaction time of flight mass spectrometer. I think uh, you might prefer calling it sniffer. This is the name I, I like very much because it is like a sniffer. It's continuously drawing air and you can look at the uh, air composition, gas phase composition in real time. So basically in less than a second, you can get the full range of volatile organic compounds. Usually uh, more than a thousand of compounds that we are now able to resolve. And we were able to put this instrument to the mobile uh, lab SUV. And you can see it here. You can preview uh, the data in real time, what's, what's happening when you're driving. To be honest, I found it very difficult to resist temptation not to look at the screen because I needed to focus on driving. But it was a lot of fun. And uh, I would like to thank Mary Haber who um, contributed with a nice article in two languages, English and Spanish. So you can read uh, about the study. So uh, my lab is in at the KJ Pickle Research Campus. It's in North Austin. And this is where um, we have amazing resources. You can put the mobile lab in store overnight, connect to the power supply. And it's about 20 minutes from Southeast Austin, those areas that I was talking about, uh, airport and so on. So because there's little time, I will just first start from total VOCs. Well, total VOCs is a kind of infamous uh, term because it's uh, used by consumer grade sensors, but fundamentally total VOCs don't tell you everything because it really depends what kind of composition there is. If it's ethanol, acetic acid, maybe it's not so, um, so bad. But generally, if you look at this total VOCs, so these uh, tracks are colored by uh, the sum of VOCs. It's, it's the sum of uh, more than 1,000 VOCs that passed quality cr cr criteria. And what you can see that like in majority of Austin areas, it's relatively low. It's, it's uh, mostly below 100 uh, PP, uh, uh, PPB of total VOCs. So you can see elevated VOCs around uh, Austin airport area. And there are some hotspots. For example, here you can see um, one hotspot uh, turned out to be Walnut uh, Creek wastewater treatment plant. And I also fingerprinted those emissions. And I know that um, most of these emissions are not very toxic. So for example, organic acids, there are some sulfur containing compounds, DMS and so on. But um, overall, this concentration, you, you don't really see above 300 PPB. It's somewhere in between this range and it's, which is elevated compared to pristine environment, but not as high as indoor air. In indoor air, you often get more than one ppm of compound. So I'm going to focus on just one example, benzene, which is usually not easily uh, measured. It would not be detected by TVOC um, sensors, for example. And it has known toxicity. There have been many studies that linked benzene to uh, benzene exposure to leukemia, to other cancers. So th this is the area around Austin Airport. And you can see that Around Austin, you, there's pretty pretty high, uh, um, pretty elevated level of benzene. It's still trace level. It's uh, 150 ppt to uh, this range, 1.5 uh, ppb. 
And interestingly, also in the terminal area, there are uh, significant enhancements in, uh, in benzene consistent with jet fuel. And if you, we look at the bigger picture a little bit of benzene, well, interestingly, this benzene is pretty high on the road. So like unlike TVOCs and some other VOCs, like in terms of benzene, it's really, really abundant everywhere where the roads are. So well, obviously these emissions can be from uh, potentially other uh, uh, motor vehicles, could be from, uh, but, but the, also the, the question is if they can come from asphalt. So we are very interested in these asphalts and uh, we, uh, we decided to follow up with a pilot study with Professor Basin, who is an expert in asphalt engineering. And we basically exposed asphalts to different temperatures in the GC oven, and we were blown away. If you heat up, the emission is exponentially dependent on temperature. And the number of compounds, we can see this has been one of the most chemically complex mixtures uh, we could imagine, we approaching 2000 compounds that we detect. So to embrace this complexity, you can, for example, we can use a hierarchical clustering model that can really fingerprint nicely and show the similarities between different, uh, so it's a little bit like a DNA of asphalts. So we fingerprinted nicely uh, asphalts from Qatar, from different geographical regions and in different oxidation blankets, because we wanted to understand how the oxidation is occurring. The scale of this approach is that you can also embrace different uh, families of compounds. So for example, oxidized and reduced aromatics, phenolics, aliphatics, and lots of others, but also individual compounds. So, um, uh, so I, I now would like to change gear just a little bit and move you and, uh, and let's travel about two kilometers, uh, sorry, two hours from Austin to an oil and gas extraction region. So you remember, this is the same scale, TVOC scale, as we saw earlier for Austin, and we didn't see much, uh, much red. Whereas here, it's actually consistently, we see more than 300 ppb, and actually in many times, more than ppm, as I will show you in a second in a video. Um, and so these concentrations, these are now comparable to the indoor air. If you ventilate the house, it, it, you will basically not really, um, it will not help much potentially. But um, the, the other thing is that the composition of this TVOC now is much more dangerous because it's, it would contain aromatics and, and other compounds and there are community living close to these uh, regions. So just to refresh your, memory and a flashback on what in, uh, in uh, Austin is actually not so bad, much lower than at Carnes City, much lower concentrations. But these trace level pollutants that we measured are important for ozone formation, for particle formation. These are important precursors. So we need to understand and also localize effects to air toxics. So I would like to show you a little bit how we were driving, but I'm showing here a video and uh, some example of VOCs and also the sum of VOCs. So I'm showing benzene, styrene, and um, uh, uh, compounds consistent with dioxin and DMS. I will fast forward a little bit for the sake of time. You can see there was uh, a little bit of enhancement in, in benzene and styrene here. So these would be correlated in a plume from uh, oil and gas extraction activities, but non-flaring. What you can see on the TVOCs, it's, it's gradually increasing. And you will see in a, in a second, we'll get to the gas extraction. You can see active flaring here. And there you go. It's basically benzene is going through the roof, not so much styrene there, but at the same time, uh, the fingerprint, the whole fingerprint that this number of compounds that we're able to observe um, also raised by orders of magnitude. So this is the cool thing about this dashboard is that you can like go to that plume and you can fingerprint each plume. So you can see like the concentration drop after you go out of the plume. But what's really concerning, you can see the school bus here. 
So there are communities who live close to those oil and gas refineries and they are really exposed to high level of pollution. So with that, I would like to summarize that we conducted first spatial temporal mapping of VOC composition uh, in Austin and oil gas region. And there are some questions that we would like to address in the future. For example, what is the role of heated asphalts for air quality and health? Our study seems consistent with the very recent study by collaborator Drew Gentner from Yale that uh, showed that uh, it's a nice paper in Science Advances uh, showing that emissions from asphalts exceed those from motor vehicles on national scale. And another question is, where are the pollution hotspots in Austin? And uh, where do they correlate with adverse health effects? So we are going to, um, and, and also important thing is to look at toxicity. So we have this nice EPA CompTOX database, which contains almost 1 million compounds. And many of them contain toxicity values. The issue is that some of them do not contain toxicity values. So I will welcome all suggestions and uh, ideas for future measurements. We plan another round of, um, of studies. So any, any examples of odorous places to sniff and we would love to synergize further with Colchem. With that, I would like to thank all the people who have contributed and, may, and enabled this amazingly fascinated study, fascinating study. Uh, in particular, my uh, outstanding grad students, Daniel Bloomdahl and Riley uh, Robertson, who worked on this data set and contributed with some data. So um, we are very happy to collaborate. Thank you all for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the uh, further talks and exciting discussion. Excellent, Pavel. That was fantastic. I think Allison is uh, transitioning over for Sergio. Are you up next? Sergio's up next, yes. And I believe he'll be sharing his slides. Can you see them now? We yes. can. Perfect. Excellent. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you so much, Pavel. That was an amazing talk. It's really phenomenal work you're doing. Uh, great to meet you all. I'm Sergio Castellanos. I lead the Reset Lab here at UT. I'm a first semester professor, so I'm always excited to get to know new colleagues in the field, and I'm really happy to share a little bit of the piece of work that I've been doing over the past um, months and years uh, to get some feedback, hear your thoughts, but also open to collaborations as well. Uh, for, the uh, for the 10 minutes ahead of me, I'll talk about uh, urban transportation and specifically uh, sensing data to make it more equitable. Um, so specifically, what are we trying to achieve uh, here in the Reset Lab is uh, to develop uh, data-driven tools that can make uh, equitable decision-making in cities, essentially. Uh, today, I'll briefly describe three related projects across three cities. Uh, this is, uh, again, synthesized, and the hope is that some of these elements might be transferable to Austin and its surroundings. So as I mentioned, I focus on the transportation sector for this talk, which is uh, a key driver for greenhouse gas emissions, and the hypothesis here is around the cleaning of it, and essentially that if there are investments in clean modes of transportation, that can improve uh, access uh, to marginalized communities, their economic opportunities as well, but also uh, have improvements in their health and uh, social benefits as well. So the first case is in Mexico City. And so what you see here is um, a, a map of the greater Mexico City actually, which contains or hosts people in the order of 20 million or so. So that number fluctuates plus or minus a couple of million, but it's, it's huge, it's a megalopolis. And what you see is a map of that region, which contains Mexico City and different states. Um, and this is an aggregated number for PM 2.5. So the goal here is to develop an index that we can further use for other studies. But that, that index is constructed mainly from uh, variables related to pollution and also to social vulnerability or population. So you see here, first the pollution, we are collecting data from air quality monitors that are official monitors from the city and, and the region as a whole. 
And from this, we construct percentiles that go from worst as shown uh, in dark red to the best, in this case, lighter color. And this is related to transportation environmental burden, if you will. So we do this assessment for PM 2.5 data acquired over the course of three years um, in eight hour intervals. Um, PM 10 as well, uh, ozones, and all of these are of course related to uh, detrimental health outcomes as it's been uh, well known for, for by everyone here in, in this talk. Um, and then another indicator that we are uh, utilizing in this case, it's uh, as a proxy, it's, it's traffic congestion. So in this case, we have partnered with the app Waze in Mexico in collecting data for uh, 10 cities on a minute level resolution. So what this tells us is the congestion level is the average streets uh, segment speed and in other variables. And at the end of the day, what you see here is, for example, a map of Mexico City, not really like a geo reference map, but rather, or constructed from a shape file, but rather painted through traffic events. In this case, they go from light blue, which is uh, just light congestion, to really dark red, which is a highly congested avenue. And so this minute level resolutions allows us then to map how close are people to uh, traffic intense uh, street segment. Um, all these variables are uh, weighted equally in terms of the pollution and pollution proxy to then uh, be uh, constructed in the same format for vulnerable population. So we collect data uh, uh, from different variables such as asthma, as you can see in this image upper left, um, indigenous population or indigenous language speaking population, which is a proxy also for uneven opportunities in the context of Latin America, looking at total population, Vulnerable ages uh, below six and above 65 years old where they're living, uh, looking again at the percentiles in terms of concentration. Uh, uh, everything here is resolved, or most of everything is resolved at a, a head level, which is the equivalent of a census tract. Similar um, limited mobility, and lastly, urban marginalization. So all of this allows us to construct, uh, in collaboration with the government, shall I say, this study was uh, with them, um, uh, index that can serve as uh, a visual representation of where and how to prioritize regions for improvements when it comes to transportation. So this is just a process and I'll, I'll come back to this specific case or Mexico City um, because we're building up of, on this to construct more detailed studies in the space of transportation. But before, that, before I do that, let me uh, take you to the city of Oakland, California where we are similarly developing an urban-based environmental justice index in transportation, but now making some improvements such as the one that I talked about the uh, traffic related, but now in air quality. So in this case, we're leveraging on data from a former UT professor, Josh Apti, in which different pollutants are also uh, measured at a high spatial and time frequency, such as what uh, Professor Pavel just talked about. This is very specific for Oakland. Um, and so, from that type of data and that index construction, we can now start looking into public transportation where we can quantify and affirm that for different transportation related pollutants, streets with buses, as you can see here, um, tend to have higher concentrations of different transportation related pollutants than streets with, without buses. And this is also uh, consistent in uh, streets with the same width. Um, and so from this, uh, we can then try to couple this, uh, this data sets to understand and select the bus routes that have the highest uh, environmental justice burden, but also uh, cover uh, specific places within the city. Uh, what I mean by that is that we can identify a specific number of bus routes. So what you see in this graph is essentially on the x-axis is the percentage covered of, um, of EJ index, uh, the higher the burden or the higher the color or the higher the value on the x-axis, the more burden with transportation related uh, variables, but also on the y-axis, how much of that bus route is uh, collected in that segment of the EJ coverage. And so we can start identifying the most, uh, the, the bus routes that are more, uh, more in need of a intervention. Um, so furthermore, to uh, elucidate civic participation in a distributively just way, we also start exploring those blocks that are in close proximity or like in immediate contact with those uh, most uh, environmentally burdened bus routes. So what you see here on the right-hand side is just a zoom in 
dispersion of bots on the left-hand side is just the blocks that really make contact with the bus route, so immediate exposure to the pollution system buses. And through Google Sunroofs, we can now uh, sense and quantify the solar PV potential photovoltaics, solar energy uh, to really power if there was a case that these buses were electrified, how much could they contribute to this process of electrifying their community and the buses that are passing through their streets. And this draws direct inspiration and applicability from an ongoing project in Oakland in which plots are being tested in this transition to net zero, which include PV modules in this case. And this is the eco block project, in which blocks are selected and then they're being retrofitted to be net zero. So it's just a way of visioning this emerging of starting off from the, the this data intensive index to then higher applicability. But we're also looking into uh, private transportation. So adding other social demographic variables and depending whether someone has or doesn't have any vehicle, we can also start to identify potential promissory regions to start uh, identifying um, possible interventions. The last uh, place that I want to talk to you about is uh, and virtually take you to it's Mexicali in Baja California, which is border with California. Uh, this is the city of Calexico and then south is Mexicali. So the relevance of this city in this context is that it tends to be labeled as the most polluted city uh, on par sometimes with Mexico City. So that's to say something. Uh, and this is a city with the highest rates of uh, doctor visits and deaths per capita related to degraded air quality. So we're focusing on two aspects of transportation, both the public, but also the uh, walking. You know, we're exploring other dimensions of transportation. Um, in public, again, we're building off of the EJ index. We're looking at the bus routes. We're also now uh, evaluating the, with a, low, a, degrade, uh, a network of low cost uh, air quality sensors. This, uh, development of, of index. Um, in fact, there's an ongoing project uh, proposal in this case to do something along those lines here in Austin, which I've talked to uh, Pavel and Tim Keat as well, and which I'm happy to chat more about uh, later. But um, from this, we're building off and constructing this. And then something interesting from this bus route is that uh, looking only at the top five bus routes based on this index, we can see on the right-hand axis or the right-hand side of this table, that almost 50% of the city, wh whether you bucket by a population, a vulnerable population below or above 60 years old or male or female, almost 50%, like almost half the city lives within close proximity to these buses. So that only calls for you know, a higher, um, uh, closer inspection to these bus routes. So taking a step further, what we're doing right now is develop, uh, deploying uh, GPS enabled sensors on the buses. So we're measuring on a, a, a one hertz frequency, the driving cycles in partnership with an industry stakeholder. So we can get a sense of how they drive, how much electricity would they consume if they were electrified? And by consequence, you know, the technical and potential financial feasibility of turning this fleet from diesel to electrical. Uh, the last part is the, the other mode of transportation, the walking component, which, you know, with Kavi, we had to be creative how to sense this and how to evaluate the walking conditions of, of the, of the sidewalks. Uh, what you see here is just regions where we uh, started to evaluate um, this, the, the quality. And we did this through Street View. Uh, we quantified you know, what the walkability, the quality is based on um, uh, obstructions. And I can go in more detail later on if you want, but uh, just visually, you can see what a nice site, what would look for someone you know, to, to use less uh, private or public transportation. But then if you start looking at the really a poor quality sidewalk, you can see places what we categorize as having horizontal obstacles. Um, also places having vertical obstacles is quite evident that it's really it makes it hard in a close proximity to a bus station to get to it. Um, and then of course, the most evident in which you can see the lack of uh, infrastructure, but also how it impacts vulnerable population uh, it's recorded here for perpetuity on Street View, which is in this case, less than five minutes away from a bus stop, you see this old lady having difficult access to really engage and have uh, decent and uh, access to a private, uh, public transportation. So with that, you know, uh, the next steps we're thinking on terms of transferring this to Austin or here in Texas is looking at associations between air quality, but also different modes of transportation, whether if it's uh, transit public or also bikeability. Um, and in the case of Mexico City and other cities, how do we build up from this equity-based index and start aggregating data-intensive approaches such as the terrain, the grid capacity, 
uh, looking at uh, GPS enabled devices to analyze the driving cycles, but then automate this for an entire city to determine which are the most um, important bus routes to be taking a look at to really electrify them. Um, so in summary, we can find inequity as we start looking into a uh, sustainable energy transition and tools that are data-driven can help us identify it and start collectively thinking on them. So with that, I just wanna thank some of the sponsors and colleagues and I would be more than happy to continue these discussions with any of you that might be interested in. Thank you. Very nice, Sergio, that was fantastic. Um, Dev, I think you're up. Yeah, that was awesome. I think both Pavel and Sergio, uh, I'm, I'm excited about uh, what we can do together following uh, this, uh, this uh, information that you have shared now. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is essentially uh, a nice transition in terms of uh, how do you now take this information uh, from data to information is one thing people do, but even sort of like, how do you make it usable? Uh, I really liked what uh, uh, Sergio was mentioning about the environmental justice index, uh, EJI, and how it could be used by policymakers, for instance. Uh, but in the context of usability, even within the researchers, like if I were to get data from Powell and give it to Sergio, and somewhere in between, there is a handshake that needs to occur where that point sample or the gridded sample that, or the point data that is available needs to be put in a gridded format. And then that becomes relevant for developing the maps and the indices and such that you start capturing the realm of uh, variability, spatial temporal variability and so forth. A lot of my work uh, deals with the issue of uh, weather and climate extremes and trying to develop an understanding that how do you develop uh, cities that are sustainable to these shocks, uh, which uh, apparently Texas is a magnet for now in terms of uh, hurricanes, whether you're talking droughts, whether you're talking thunderstorms with floods, and of course the uh, winter freeze and so forth. So how do you develop data sets? How do you develop tools and um, systems that can be used by the communities that they can go and develop better systems that are not just responsive to short-term climate variability, but also for the longer-term climate change. So for instance, we are working with the city in terms of climate projections and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to share a bit of uh, that framework that the prime work that we focus on is how do you help hazards from becoming disasters? So if you have heat waves, if you have rainfall, air pollution and so forth, these hazards are naturally occurring and then humans by their inaction or wrong decisions convert those hazards into disasters. And, and information that is lacking often is the timeliness of it, the usability of it, and the ability to look up at right choices. And so that's sort of like where we feel that the use of a good scientific understanding and developing of engineering tools could make that system of where people want to do the right thing versus what actually happens can be bridged in a better way. Uh, an important aspect of this particular part becomes the improvement of predictions uh, across multiple scales. I mean, we have uh, climate projections which could be at global to regional scales, but very often what you need is uh, what the environmentalist used to say, not in my backyard, the NIMBY, in fact, now everyone says YIMBY, yes, I want it in my backyard. So the information is really required there now. And so how do you scale these things up? That is a major aspect that is missing in terms of how we want to translate data to usable information. And then there's this big aspect of, uh, we have our physical understanding, the manner in which uh, systems work very well understood, but uh, the human activities and uh, humans have an in amazing ability to uh, do something stupid. And how do you design a system which actually has that stochasticity or stupidity built into it? And none of that could be intentional. It is just that we have a propensity for that. 
So bringing human activities, human decisions in part of the whole system is another part of where we try to do, but also taking the data in terms of the exposure where we go. So end of the day, what we try to achieve is create tools, data sets, learning environments that can help individuals and broader communities, uh, both from municipalities, like we are working a lot with the city of Austin, or in fact, even with the global agencies uh, like the UNDP and so forth going forward. A uh, lot of work that we are doing is sort of like under this four bins, uh, discoverability, where it is hardcore, scientific, hypothesis-driven research, what happens if you put green roofing, what happens if you are getting a thunderstorm coming in, what are the physics by which it's changing. But so a lot of it is with innovation in terms of trying to bring in the disciplinary knowledge from a, uh, other groups. A uh, lot of it is from the computer graphics world, from the AI ML kind of world into our discipline. And that's the sort of innovative aspect that goes into what we do. And the key aspect here is scalability, as I mentioned, in terms of uh, you know, regional to small scale, small scale to region, such that you have that flexibility in the upscale, downscale environment. And of course, the usability part, where we are working a lot with the stakeholders in the participatory research framework. And of course, this collaboration, none of this I do. It is always with an amazing team. I mean, I'm, I'm already had work uh, doing work with uh, Pavel and Kerry on a couple of proposals now. And I'm so excited to know about what Sergio is doing. And I'm looking forward to an opportunity to work with him to take some of these things to um, elements going forward. So one of the example of the work that we have been doing for the city of Austin, uh, which uh, just has been as a new NOAA project is mapping heat around the city where we are putting, last year we had some uh, very low cost sensors that we draw around the city. And on building on that, we developed a proposal that uh, there are four cities that were selected. One is Austin, Houston, the city of uh, uh, Phoenix, and uh, Boston, but also Boston is working with uh, Jersey City and uh, uh, not Boston, sorry, Baltimore, uh, Jersey City, as well as one city in California. So we are trying to develop the, for Austin, a heat and air quality analysis principally in terms of putting sensors, looking at mobile sensors, that uh, what Pavel will be actually doing. And we have a very a nice partnership that has evolved with Microsoft Research, where they have just signed on MOA about putting, they have something called a Project Eclipse, uh, low cost sensors, I'll show you a slide. And we are trying to put these sensors across the city, uh, both with the transportation department as well as on campus and get some data going uh, for that part. A large part of this effort is actually not just getting the data, but also this data model integration, uh, where we have uh, the statistical data assimilation or weather research forecast models. So you get these three scales that I show at the bottom. At the lowest one on the left is actually the UT Austin and the area around that, um, where you can see the bell tower and the, the temperature patterns and the greenness fraction. The second one is what something we worked with Powell about with his sniffer data for the Del Valley region where you can see the wind flow and how the temperatures were changing and how these patterns were changing to help and try explain some of the data sets that could emerge. The one next to it is actually a satellite based assessment where you're looking at the pre-COVID versus post COVID or, or within COVID um, concentrations of NOx as well as temperatures that could be captured by the satellite data. And then there's of course, uh, somebody very, very amazing here. I don't know who that is on the top right. Uh, and uh, measuring some measure and think this is the map we got from uh, the city about the temperature and so forth. Now, very similar to what uh, Sergio was mentioning, there is a uh, city groups involved, Gava and the city of Austin trying to take people's perception about those heat elements that we have measured, do they actually find it and how do we map those things and so forth. So how do we actually go across the scales? I'm gonna give you one example of a very exciting technique that we have been sort of pioneering in the last year or so. Now think about it this way. You have data and you create an image. Very often the data you have is say 10 by 10 kilometer grid or say one kilometer by one kilometer grid if you're in the weather system or you would have information from a sensor and it has its own footprint. And you need that at either personal scale where you're trying to understand what's the exposure or you're trying to get it along a region where you're trying to see what is the communities for something like what the EG index uh, Sergio was mentioning about. So 
One approach is where we have been doing all the statistical thing like Kriging, GIS-based systems and so forth. But think this way, ultimately, when you get this data, you are creating a map. So in the graphics community, you have a framework where if you had an image, which was low resolution, which is what happens when you have limited data, you can process it using different techniques and create a very high resolution image. Now, then we ask the question for this high resolution image, what is the data that would have been required in the first place that would have generated this high resolution image? And so we back calculate that data from that. So uh, let me explain. You start with a low resolution image to get a low resolution data to a low resolution image. You work with different ways to make that image very high resolution and then back calculate the data from that. And so that works uh, uh, in one way of getting some um, nice uh, uh, analysis. So for instance, for the city of Austin, we are doing this rainfall analysis using 10 kilometer satellite data and trying to get it down to coarser resolution, lower resolution, by going across different uh, techniques and so forth. This is the sensor, the leaf that comes from Microsoft uh, Project Eclipse. It has a CO, it has SO2, ozone, PM sensor, they say, but that PM and so forth. And these could be then put onto different traffic lights, bus shelters and so forth. And we are also putting about six of them on the campus uh, and we'll start getting some data. So it'll be really interesting to work with you, Pavel and uh, Sergio to see how we can then start building it up from that. And I know Tim is an, audience as well, and as well as Gita has a lot of interest um, that we can start thinking. So when we are looking at this data, there are two types of problems when you're doing this transition. One is where you have the data available that itself is not there. And the second is that you have the data available, but what do you make of it? And so how do you sort of create the input for a model? Because your model might actually require say things like the height of the building or the roughness of the building, rather than just say the image of the building. So we have been working with, again, the graphics community and the video gaming community in creating a digital uh, interface for the cities and use those digital interface to, again, reconstruct the data. So you sort of see where our work comes in, data to image, image to great quality image, and from the high quality image, come back and extract high quality data at different scales. So that's the manner in which we start working with different setups. So here's an example of a, um, uh, we just had a NASA develop uh, a summer study where over the city, we did the heat mapping from different sensors and uh, got some heat mapping maps, um, uh, heat, uh, heat maps. And we are now doing some studies where there might be actually road coolants being tried out. And uh, we are hoping Powell can actually run his sniffer before those uh, coolants are put on the, um, on the roads such that we can see the emissions before and after and so forth. And in terms of the temperature change as well as the air quality change that can happen. Here's working with the community groups like Gava, trying to see their experiences and exposures and going forward. And so this is just one example. We are doing the same thing with hurricanes, uh, landfalling hurricanes. So we have a project um, where we are looking at how do hurricanes cause rain and what could be the changes coming through. Uh, heat is of course one aspect. Uh, we just did this report with the UT Energy Institute on the winter storm. So there's some really interesting and exciting work that is coming up on that part. So on my last slide, I show what are the things that we are really looking for right now? It's this integration of low cost sensors, imagery, uh, uh, social media data sets into a manner in which we create this uh, processed information, uh, looking at the usability in the context of where things go, and uh, there's an immediate need for a collaborator. If there's somebody out there in the VR XR world, I know I've sent an email out to that XR group as well. And I'm hoping that we can get someone uh, who can start working with the data we have, with the, with the graphics we have, and create that experiential aspect going forward. And uh, we are working with a group at Texas A&M and actually with the Kinder Institute at RISE to try and then translate this uh, setup going forward. So with that, I think I am uh, going to uh, stop. And uh, uh, it's it's great to see Kevin also is here. And Kevin is Kevin Lanza. We should get him to talk at one of the next meetings. He is doing some really exciting work with regards to uh, what he has been doing with the schools, the exposure that uh, the children have, uh, what he's doing with the sensing with that part. and. Uh, uh, 
so he's here and if people have questions on that part, I would encourage that they ask him that as well. So thank you. All right, excellent. So I think we have some uh, time here for questions and there was um, really exciting projects that were presented. So um, I think given that we have a you know relatively small group here, I, uh, if you just wanna unmute and ask your question of any of the speakers, uh, now's your opportunity. You can also, of course, put it in the chat. Hi, I'll jump in because I unfortunately have to leave for another meeting here shortly, but <laughs> I really, I'm Gita Prasad, I'm a new faculty member in the Jackson School, and I think I've been email introduced to some of you and know some of you in person, but this is my first time at the seminar and I really enjoyed it and lots of really exciting work going. Um, I, coming, I come from the climate modeling community and I'm thinking about air quality and climate from a regional to global scale. And I think that's where a lot of a lot of the climate community's energy has been focused at the regional global scale when we start thinking about predictions and planning for the future. And so one of the things I'm really curious to hear about from all of the speakers is how we can think about that community reorienting itself to be more helpful to the city scale, the community scale where these decisions are actually happening? Is it a matter of a different way of thinking about the data? Is it a matter of creating new partnerships? Um, how can we make that climate prediction information more usable for this type of work? I'm happy to follow up and, and share my thoughts. Uh, it was very nice, nice uh, question. And I really resonated with uh, some things that Dev and Sergio uh, mentioned. We really should not constrain ourselves to just one scale because things happen spatial temporarily as well. I mentioned like different orders of magnitude and concentrations, but it's also the effect of scale. You can look at really fine scales. Um, well, femtoseconds with it's kind of mass spectrometric scale where you basically yeah nanoseconds but um but but for the model we really need something simple and 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 for that simple thing is the the first step is always like for me it's it's and un fundamental understanding understanding what's going on what the processes are because then you can extract factors for example in factor analysis we have many cool multivariate models and then we should be able to either find a perfect volatile tracer or marker for a process that we could fit to a climate model or to some other type of model. So I think these are mutually uh, synergistic, but the question uh, about how to embrace all these spatial temporal scales, slow chemical processes, but also fast and reactive processes. And when we think about the impact on human health, all of these might matter. The point is we don't really understand all the factors that affect human health. So I think the first step is this fundamental understanding. But at the same time, we need to think how to make, how to embrace the complexity for the models to digest and, and, and be accessible to the community. Yeah. Dev or Sergio, do you guys want to comment further on that one? I think Sergio has been doing a great job in different cities. Yeah. I would love to hear what he says. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think a lot of the decisions happen or a lot of the hope of decisions will happen at city level. So bringing those regional impacts and attribute, attribute them to actions at a city level can go a long way. So I think, you know, talking about this scale linkage resolution that Pavel is saying, you know, tracing back, you know, going from big to, to really local and, and, and working together, whoever's doing those local models and, and you know, just bringing it together would go, would be, I think, quite, quite uh, impactful. I haven't seen that much. I've seen some studies that say, you know, the spatial resolution matters a lot. Like we see one pixel uh, green, but if we, you know, increase the resolution, now we see it's like a, a shade of greens or whatnot. So that could really pinpoint to more focal actions. And I think that's, that's where the, where, where the climate action will happen most of the time. You know, one thing from a, um, 
kind of a bigger picture view that I struggle with because I'm in environmental engineering is there's decisions that are made around energy conservation, public transportation, and Sergio is getting at some of the heart of this that nominally is climate friendly, but in reality is people unfriendly for the folks who are on the receiving end of all the trucks that are bringing in the recyclables or all the recycling centers that go into their community or the, you know, in this case, if you don't electrify the buses, then the buses, uh, some of the routes are going in and out of these, uh, these neighborhoods. So um, what I'd like to see is some of the earlier decisions that were made, you know, kind of big picture, this ought to be good because it feels good. Um, actually seeing what happens to not just folks on one side of the one side of town, but what does it mean for across the community and is it equitably distributed, which is certainly some of what both Pavel, Sergio and Dev have been getting at. And I think that, um, you know, we do not want to greenwash, right? And so the fact that you recycle, but it may or may not be recycled. I mean, we really need to follow things all the way through. Does that mean the recycling facility is sitting in, um, you know, a, a less uh, wealthy part of town and they're being exposed to things that others aren't? So overall, the city feels good, yet they have not done right by or protected the health of all of their citizens. So that's some of the questions that I often ask, just big picture, you know, you're thinking about, oh, feels good, you know, algae fuel, algae to biofuel, it was all the rage. And before that, it was ethanol to biofuel, right? And if you started looking at, for instance, the ethanol example, turns out the ethanol plants were a major pollutant of hazardous air pollutants. So you're feeling really good about it, but in essence, you're actually harming the environment, harming waterways, et cetera. So there've been a lot of missteps because the analyses, a lot of what you guys are talking about weren't done. They were just that this ought to be the right thing to do and boom. And then we have to dig ourselves out of that. <laughs> so, all right, are there some other questions for our speakers? Go ahead, Dev. I just want to say thank you and I'll have to get off actually if it's, uh possible. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. But thank you very much. Uh, uh, stay safe, everyone. And I really learned quite a bit from Sergio and uh, Pavel and also the conversations, Kerry and Geeta. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to. Uh, All right. Thank you very much. So um, if there's no other questions, I think we can uh, actually wrap this up relatively on time, which is amazing. Um, any final questions? Okay, well, thank you very much to our speakers. That was excellent. Um, and um, Allison will tell us uh, how folks can have access to the recordings at some point here. I'm sure you'll send that out after uh, you get the recording set. Absolutely, I will. I'll send that All one. right, thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.